close your eyes. Are they closed? I don't believe you. Trust me, just close them. I want you to think back to your fondest gaming memory. Maybe it was getting home from school on a Friday night in 2008 and hopping into the Halo 3 XXP Weekend playlist with your buddies. Maybe it was logging into RuneScape on a summer's night in 2007, wandering around aimlessly killing goblins, fishing, cutting down trees, and taking in the atmosphere. Maybe it was waking up on a Saturday morning and playing Modern Warfare 2 all day, getting screamed at in lobbies gunning for that next weapon unlock, camo, or prestige. Maybe it was surviving your first night in Minecraft in a makeshift house built into a cliff wall, listening to the hissing of spiders, the clunking of skeletons, and the moaning of zombies as you waited for the sunrise. Or maybe for my growing Zoom audience, it was dropping into Tilted Towers in Fortnite in 2018, cranking 90s and double pumping every school trooper in your way. Whatever fond memory you're playing back in your mind right now is invoking an emotion so powerful the entertainment industry is spending billions of dollars right this second trying to make you feel it again. This emotion is nostalgia. Nostalgia is one of the most powerful emotions the brain can elicit because it's an umbrella emotion, encapsulating a number of other positive emotions. Happiness, elation, excitement, fulfillment, etc. It instantly transports you back to a time when you were truly happy. I wish there was a way to know you're in the good old days before you've actually left them. As my generation in particular have started to grow older, we've almost all realized how damn good entertainment was when we were kids. TV shows, movies, and games. Nostalgia is rife among us soon-to-be boomers. In the last five or so years, it feels like we've almost all come to some kind of collective realization that things just kind of aren't as good as they used to be sentiment that the entertainment industry has absolutely clocked onto, and as any industry does, is trying its best to tap into and monetize. Were it so easy? But it's a lot easier said than done. Nostalgia is one of the most risky emotions to try and weaponize. You walk a fine line between cheap fan service and your game just kind of feeling unrelatable, but if you can catch that sweet spot in the middle and forge an experience that feels new and fresh while also relating to a fan's golden memories from the days of yore, then you're onto a winner. Major franchises have crashed and burned in the pursuit of nostalgia. Others have risen from the ashes, and some have even been built from scratch off nostalgic foundations stemming from other franchises. But how? How does one walk this line and create a game that's nostalgic, yet tasteful? A game that feels new and fresh, but comfy and familiar at the same time? Well, my friend, with millions of dollars in spare cash to throw into the nostalgia tornado, allow me to answer that very question for you and turn those millions into billions. Oh, by the way, uh, word on the street, just something I heard, is that if you subscribe right now, apparently all those fond memories from the start of the video that I made you recall, apparently you just get to relive them all again. So, I mean, you may as well go ahead and subscribe now, right? Surely. When it comes to weaponizing nostalgia, one of the most common pitfalls that so many pieces of media fall into is focusing too much on it. Nostalgia might be the Saab bomber of emotions, but ironically, it's not strong enough to hold up an entire game on its own. It's actually a rather two-dimensional emotion. Take Dead Rising 4, for example. This entire game was marketed on nostalgia. It was set in the Willamette Mall from Dead Rising 1. You played as Frank West again from Dead Rising 1. But when you play the game, you realize that this nostalgia is kind of all that it offers, and even the way that it incorporates that nostalgia is incredibly shallow. Everything new that it tries to do is just hollow, lifeless, empty garbage. It tried to ride on its nostalgic hook far too much, and in doing so, it completely failed to build a strong, fresh experience off that hook, in turn, creating what, for me, is the single worst video game that I have ever played in my life, and probably ever will play. Seriously, I wish I could forget all memories I have of this game. What an abomination.
Battlefield 2042 tried to ride on its hyper-nostalgic surface that really had nothing behind it. Yeah, in all the trailers, the game just looked like a bigger, better version of everything that you loved about Battlefield 3 and 4. But when you actually played it, well, the nostalgia wore off pretty fast because of how broken, empty, and hollow the experience really was. Don't be sad. This is just how it works out sometimes. If you focus too much on just retreading old ground, a lot of the time, you just end up with a shit rest of the game that, in some cases, almost seems to overcompensate from its focus on nostalgia by radically changing too many core elements of the game's formula that don't need changing. I mean, Dead Rising 4 and Battlefield 2042 are just prime examples of this. But even if you do manage to create a somewhat competent experience using nostalgia, you then run the risk of having that emotion overpower the new parts of the experience, in turn failing to create any new memories for players that are gonna make them nostalgic for this game in 10 years time like they are for the game that came before. You see, nostalgia is a really dangerous emotion. It only exists if you have a truly fond memory of an experience, which requires that experience to have some sort of exceptional quality to it. And so, when it comes to building a new experience off that nostalgia, it's even more of an uphill battle because you're competing with something that you know people already love, and you've got to somehow find a way to outdo that. Because if you don't, well, it doesn't matter how technically good your new game or movie or whatever is, it's standing in the shadow of its beloved former self, and if it can't find a way to cast an even bigger shadow of its own, then by the law of comparison, it'll instinctively be looked at in a negative light. And I can't think of a more fitting example of this than Back for Blood. Turtle Rock Studios did everything they possibly could to hype this thing up as Left 4 Dead 3. In its presentation, its design, its marketing, literally everything about this game was Left 4 Dead 3. And so, when it released, and we realised that it paled in comparison to Left 4 Dead in almost every conceivable way, its fate was sealed. As a standalone title, I don't think Back 4 Blood was particularly awful, but because of the way that its developers tried to use nostalgia, it couldn't be seen as a standalone title, nor was it judged as one. It was judged as a direct follow-on to a series that is both beloved and also has stood the test of time remarkably well while offering a less enjoyable, less satisfying, less memorable, more buggy take on its formula that it was meant to be celebrating. I think as well, Outer Worlds fell into a sort of similar trap, but without the input of modern gaming. This game's entire shtick was that it was basically a classic Fallout-esque game made by none other than Obsidian, the geniuses behind Fallout New Vegas. And although in many areas it did kind of feel like a 360-era Fallout game, the actual substance beyond that nostalgia just didn't capture me like I hoped it would, and I know that a lot of other people felt a similar way. But thankfully, Thankfully, that's not always the case. Modern Doom is far more entrenched in the nostalgia of original Doom than Doom 3, for example. And yet, it finds a way to craft an entirely new experience with that nostalgia that feels both fresh and familiar. It's full of homages and callbacks, both subtle and rather glaring, but it manages to ride that sweet spot perfectly. It feels eternally faithful and nostalgic, while also providing a fresh Doom experience and continuing to forge the path ahead for the Doom franchise. If you're going to lean heavily into nostalgia, this right here is how you do it. You use it broadly across the game's experience as the hook, but you make sure that you build off it and naturally. You use the new experience to continue forging the path that its predecessor started. Now, Doom does this absolutely immaculately, but no game, not one single game, will ever come as close as doing it as well as Old School RuneScape. Old School RuneScape, if you somehow don't know, is an official classic version of RuneScape that's separate to the main version of the game that was built off an old backup from 2007. This game does not look, sound, play, or behave like a modern game whatsoever, and yet it saved the IP and its developers from fading into obscurity. How? Nostalgia.
In the early 2010s, thanks to a litany of poor gameplay and monetization updates that were geared at modernizing the game, RuneScape was dying and pretty quick. And so, in a last ditch effort, Jagex launched the old school service to try and stop the bleeding. And what followed was a beautiful version of the game that feels identical to the game that you and your friends gathered around the old CRT PC monitor on a warm summer's night to play back in 2007, but with a vast swath of new content, all built in the style of classic RuneScape. Old School RuneScape still invokes the exact same emotions as it did 15 years ago, but the best thing is that its experience runs so much deeper than its nostalgia. It really is genius how Jagex have handled this game long term. I feel like this kind of experience is way too easy to fuck up whilst being so damn hard to get right, and yet they've consistently managed to nail it. This game proves the strength of nostalgia when it's used right. Sometimes I get the feeling that certain franchises are rather scared of leaning too heavily into nostalgia, and oftentimes this rejection of nostalgia and what came before can lead to radical change for no apparent reason. It's almost as if they feel like the only way to progress the franchise forward is by changing everything in the name of treading new ground, right? But in reality, a lot of the time, it's more effective and efficient to kind of just stand still and let what came before take you down the path that it already carved out. I liken this approach to standing on a train and heading down its already laid tracks over walking through the snow and carving out a path in it to move forward, relying on what came before to lead you into the future rather than trying to constantly create that future as you go. Okay, right, maybe that sounds way too, like, faux big brain and faux philosophical, so let me give you an example to kind of elaborate on what I mean. Counter-Strike. Although, yes, it has undergone some changes, Counter-Strike now is very, very similar to Counter-Strike 20 years ago. It has the same teams, the same mechanics, the same weapons, the same maps, the same game modes. Hell, weapons still even have the exact same spray patterns as they did in the early 2000s. Counter-Strike doesn't use nostalgia, Counter-Strike is nostalgia. Don't get me wrong, I don't think that every franchise out there needs to follow Counter-Strike's suit, but I think the way that Valve have managed to continuously grow Counter-Strike's popularity without the need for radical changes to its formula is rather remarkable. Even more so when you consider that it's starting to spawn copycats. I mean, Valorant is purpose-built as a competitor to Counter-Strike that seeks to bank off its evidently classic and nostalgia fueled formula with a slightly different, equally high-skilled and maybe a little more modern take on it. Don't get me wrong, nostalgia is not the main reason that Counter-Strike and Valorant are popular right this very second, but the reason that one is still around and the other was created is because people have such fond memories of a classic title and formula, and because of that, they don't want to see that formula change. Similarly, nostalgia for some things has been so strong in recent years that developers have managed to craft or resurrect, it kind of depends how you look at it, entire genres solely fueled by it. Boomer shooters, sparked at least in part by the rebirth of Doom, an entire genre of 90s slash Y2K era shooters have been born that span a multitude of different settings and themes. Dusk, Ultra Kill, Proteus, a medieval, just a few of the exceptionally unique games that this new retro genre have created. This is an era of games experiencing a renaissance so strong they formed a new genre entirely, and it's all fueled by nostalgia. But nostalgia doesn't have to be used in broad sweeping ways like resurrecting the 90s or saving entire franchises to be used well. It can work equally well when used more subtly to enhance an experience rather than to create or dictate one. And one of my favourite ways that this is done is by revisiting nostalgic settings, concepts and mechanics but in a new light. And this is the bit where I get to splurge about how thankful I am for modern Resident Evil. As well as heavily repurposing many beloved mechanics from Resident Evil 4, Resident Evil Village also resurrected elements of the iconic Resident Evil 3.5 build. 
which was fucking awesome because that was a version of Resident Evil that never saw the light of day. It was a version that we never got to play. Our only exposure to it is watching like a 144p YouTube video. And its predecessor, Resident Evil 7, resurrected the concept of progressively exploring an old gothic mansion, packed full of puzzles, locked doors, and horrors round every corner that made the first Resident Evil so iconic and loved, but with the new added flair of a first-person perspective. And actually, I think that Modern Warfare 2 2 did a really good job at this as well by taking COD 4's iconic all gillied up level and giving us a more open and less linear take on its core idea. It reused its grim, foggy, ghillie suit sniping experience that every human who's ever even seen a controller adores, but also gave us more freedom in how we crept through the grass, how we approached enemy encampments, and quietly dropped hostiles. This is a really great way to weaponize nostalgia because at first you get that cool nostalgic feeling of experiencing something that you loved in a previous game, but then that feeling of nostalgia is quickly outweighed by the new purpose that these ideas have in the new experience. But I think where this kind of style of nostalgia weaponization truly shines is with storytelling. Having a part of a new story hook into an old story and not just relate or reference it, but enhance both the new and the old is a great way to give nostalgia a real purpose. Dark Souls 3 did this excellently with its return to Anor Londo. Seeing how this once beautiful gothic city had fallen as the light had faded was fantastic environmental storytelling that gave you a glimpse into what was going on beyond what you as a player, as an ashen one or unkindled one, could experience, and then discovering the remains, or lack thereof, of iconic characters from Dark Souls 1 in Anor Londo provided melancholic conclusions to their stories. You know, it's not a Souls game unless even the most basic characters make you shed a tear. MGS4 taking Snake back to Shadow Moses Island from the first Metal Gear Solid was one hell of a nostalgia trip that, yeah, on the surface might just look like fan service, but the way it played into the game's theme of aging, loss, and coming full circle was excellently crafted. When done tastefully, fan-favourite and long-lost elements of a franchise returning like this only adds to an experience. One of my fondest memories of this kind of storytelling in recent years was actually in Gears of War 5, when you return to the New Hope facility from Gears of War 2. Revisiting one of the key locations from my favourite Gears campaign and fighting the same enemies that we fought there 11 years ago, all while having purpose for the story that was currently being told, was fantastic. That is how you use nostalgia in storytelling. Oh, and of course, honourable mention to the one, the only, Captain Jacob Keyes making an appearance in a flashback in Halo Infinite to build into Chief and Cortana's storyline. Absolutely masterful. I, I just, I had to mention that. This kind of nostalgia can also be used to fill in gaps in older stories as well that maybe their original stories didn't get to fill in for whatever reason. And one of my favourite examples of this are the remasters of Halo 1 and Halo 2, in particular, their terminals. These hidden cutscenes revealed more about the history of 343 Guilty Spark and how loneliness on the ring caused his mind to slowly deteriorate making him kind of how he was in Halo 1. And then, in Halo 2, these terminals gave backstory to the heretic leader, showing how his faith in the Covenant was fractured and how he turned on his former leaders before you as the Arbiter assassinated him. But although these examples make it look like nostalgia is this great thing that can only bolster storytelling, it can be a very dangerous game if you rely on it too much. Bringing back an old gameplay mechanic that people loved is one thing, but having an entire story based on nostalgia can be kind of rough, and I think we see this quite a lot with modern reinterpretations of classic stories. Modern Warfare 2 tried to take the main story beats of classic Modern Warfare 2 and redo them in a new way, and what we ended up with was a story that mostly failed to invoke any nostalgia because it changed too much about the nostalgic elements so they didn't feel nostalgic anymore. But then, at the same time, it also created a story that failed to be captivating as a standalone new experience because it didn't have enough of its own identity. 
It failed rather miserably at using nostalgia in a broad sense, but I think some of its more minor uses and more subtle uses were in fact a lot better. I mean, like I said, the new take on the all gillied up level was fantastic, and as well, Ghost swapping out his edgy airsoft mask that they for some reason gave him in Modern Warfare 2019 for his OG Modern Warfare 2 Ghost Balaclava, now with added meaning as well, was fantastic. With the continuing boom of remakes of classic games, I think we're only going to start to see more of this in the coming years. For obvious reasons, remakes are the ultimate form of nostalgia weaponization, for reasons that I don't think I need to go into, and with how rife nostalgia is nowadays, they've almost become their own genre in and of themselves. Where new and standalone titles can't rely too heavily on nostalgia, the entire purpose of remakes is to bring those nostalgic memories of those classic titles into the modern day. An effort that is in fact a lot harder than it seems to get right. For all of the fantastic remakes out there, like the remakes of Resident Evil 1 and 2, Halo 2 Anniversary, technically a remaster but you see what I mean, and Demon Souls, there are an equal number of absolutely trash remakes and remasters. Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary, What is that? Warcraft 3 Reforged, etc, etc. Where some developers choose to honour and respect the nostalgia that beloved classic titles have given us, others prey on it to make a quick buck, with little regard for quality or standards, and so the kind of remake genre can be rather contentious. Whenever you hear about one of your favourite classic games getting a modern remake, the emotions that wash over you are always the same. Firstly, you're like, holy shit, let's go, they actually remembered this game exists. And then a few days pass and you're like, oh god, oh no, please don't fuck it up, please don't fuck it up, please don't fuck it up. Right now, I'm going through that exact emotional cycle for the Resident Evil 4 remake and also the Splinter Cell remake. And I can assure you, when the inevitable Metal Gear Solid remakes get announced, which, I mean, come on, at this point, they're like the worst kept secret in gaming, I have a feeling that that emotional cycle is going to be amplified a hundredfold. But if there's anybody out there who knows how to weaponize nostalgia by repurposing classic games, it's Bethesda and Skyrim. Who's laughing now? You've got Skyrim for every Xbox. You've got Skyrim for every PlayStation. Skyrim for PC. Skyrim for Switch. Skyrim for PlayStation VR. Skyrim for regular VR. Skyrim Special Edition. Skyrim Anniversary Edition. You can even get Skyrim for your fucking Amazon Alexa now, which was news to me. Why? <laughs> Alexa, play Skyrim. Stop right there, criminal scum. FBI, open up! But you know, as much as many people, myself included, will absolutely meme on Bethesda for the eternal porting of Skyrim, I actually kind of think that it's a really good way to monetize people's nostalgia for a game. Making a beloved game playable on just about every platform in a variety of different ways is Fantastic! Like, I don't see the problem with that. I mean, hell, I would honestly love it if other franchises followed suit. I mean, I'd love to be able to play Halo 2 on the Switch, or Metal Gear Solid 4 on PC. I kind of wish more studios would follow suit. I think as far as weaponizing nostalgia goes, Bethesda's method with Skyrim is probably one of the coolest and least nefarious methods of doing so. But unfortunately, not everyone treats classic titles with as much respect as others. I wish that we lived in a world where everyone treated classic titles and classic stories with as much respect as Capcom treated their remakes of Resident Evil 1 and Resident Evil 2. But alas, because of how enticing and grabby nostalgia is, it is a very easily monetizable emotion, and with how bad monetization is in modern gaming, this can often lead to depressing results. Seeing the way that COD 4's remaster went was just a heartbreaker. I mean, we should have seen it coming because, you know, it's Activision, right? It made sense. But adding microtransactions and loot boxes to COD 4's multiplayer is sacrilege. There's no other word for it. Degenerates like you belong on a cross. But they weren't just loot boxes. They were loot boxes that contained entirely new weapons that just so happened to be extremely powerful. They clocked onto everyone's nostalgia for COD 4, and instead of being content with just selling a really good remaster of the game for not far a full price, they just had to push that boat out just that little bit further and monetize it to the high heavens. 
and it only got worse in the years that followed. As games ditched loot boxes in favor of cosmetic microtransaction stores, nostalgia was preyed upon even more aggressively. Beloved elements of classic titles stopped being these cool pieces of a franchise's history that resurfaced every now and then as a nice surprise, and instead became targets for absurdly overpriced microtransactions that aimed at manipulating every fond memory a fanbase has to maximize revenue. But somehow, somehow, there exists an even worse form of nostalgia weaponization. <sighs> mobile games. We all know how bad mobile games are when it comes to monetization, but recently I stumbled across something so evil that it genuinely sickened me to my very core. This abomination. Lord of the Rings Rise to War. What can men do against such reckless hate? You see, I'm a huge, lifelong Lord of the Rings fan, and something that I always appreciated was how protective the Tolkien estate were of J.R.R. Tolkien's work. They didn't pimp it out to any corporation or publisher that came along and wanted to try and milk it. They were protective of it because they knew how important it was and how much it meant to both Tolkien and the millions upon millions of fans that it had garnered. So when I saw this, your typical hyper-monetized fake mobile game with all of Tolkien and Peter Jackson's iconic imagery slapped all over it to try and rope people into playing and throwing money at nothing. What the hell do you even buy in these games? It legit made my blood boil, even more so when I saw them advertising it as a strategy game. Motherfucker, there is only one Lord of the Rings strategy game out there and it sure as shit ain't this pile of maggoty bread. We ain't had nothing but maggoty bread for three stinking days. Mm. Why can't we have some meat? I didn't realize how aggressively the mobile gaming scene was mutilating beloved IPs to rinse fans, whether it's to do with nostalgia or not, of every single penny they can, but my god, the reality is even worse than I thought it'd be. Oh shit. What are you saying? What are you Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, Walking Dead, you name it, if there's a major IP, there's some shitty microtransaction filled mobile game out there based on it. Trust me, if you ever happen to see a mobile game advertised for one of your favorite franchises, just pretend that you didn't see that advert and just, just move on with your life, just continue as you were. You don't want the heartache of trying that game out, trust me. The mobile gaming sphere has probably the worst and most predatory methods of monetizing nostalgia. I can't even say weaponizing the nostalgia because weaponizing it implies that they're actually making some kind of game experience about it, and that's not what these games are. They aren't actual games. They're merely platforms for extracting as much revenue from their users as is humanly possible. Gaming's weaponization of nostalgia can manifest itself in some of the best, most respectful ways, truly honoring what came before and using legacy to influence the future. And conversely, it can manifest itself in some of the ugliest and most hated elements of gaming as a medium. What's your favorite use of nostalgia in gaming? Let me hear it down below in the comments. And if this video happened to kick the old nostalgia emitters up there into gear, then make sure you show some support down below with a like and even a sub if you really enjoyed and you wanna see more like this. This is gonna be my final video of 2022. So thank you all very much for all the support this year. I think it's safe to say this has not been the year that any of us really expected. So um, thank you all very much for sticking with me. I genuinely appreciate it so much. But in 2023, my branch out effort into variety content is being amplified a hundred billion fold. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any more iconic content just like this next year. And with that said, I want to give a massive thank you to all of my amazing patrons for the support this year and for supporting me right now. Thank you all very much. I really, really appreciate it. And thank you all so much for watching. Once again, thank you all so much for the support this year. I, I really do appreciate it. And I guess I'll catch you all in 2023.